Hello everyone and welcome to our customer success story here at Optimize Press. And today I have a gentleman here in the UK. He's been working with the world's leading organizations for over 20 years. And he's now scaled down to working with some of the smaller companies, even the solopreneurs. The uh, top sales world magazine said he's one of the top 50 thought leaders in marketing and sales. And he's also a Newcastle United fan. Let me introduce you to Mr. Ian Brody. Ian, it's a real pleasure to be here. Ian, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself or your business and your background? Okay, yeah. So right now, and for the last probably about seven or eight years, I've been working primarily with consultants and coaches. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got there um, later, but primarily with people like consultants and coaches um, to help them get more clients. Uh and that is something um, I do because it's what I did myself. So my background is um, I left college. I went into a very geeky job in kind of R&D and, uh, and project management um, for a computer company here in the UK. Um, did that for a number of years. They decided they wanted to turn me into a manager and a business person, mm-hmm. sent me off to business school. Um, and it was there that I fell in love with marketing. I fell in love with strategy and marketing and decided that was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I didn't want to do any of this technical stuff anymore. So I ended up shortly after that becoming a consultant, worked for a couple of the the large global consulting firms for about 13, 14 years, Um, traveled a lot. So I worked in 17 different countries in those 13 years. Um, You know, I would usually get on a flight on a Monday morning, um, come back on a Friday night. So eventually, you know, the work was fun and interesting. It paid very well. But it was killing me, frankly, um, and I just wanted to spend more time at home, less time on planes, um, less time, you know, in hotel rooms, and so I set up my own business. And you whereabouts in the UK? Could you remind everyone? Of- I am in Cheshire, so I'm about uh, I don't know ten miles south of Manchester, kind of in the little countryside in Cheshire. Um, Not far from actual James is up there for Optimized Press. He's actually James Dyson is up that way as well. Cool. He's not far from you, so... <laughs> Where exactly is, is James based? <clears throat> he's Cheshire as well. Oh, right. I, so, thought he was, I thought he was from Sheffield, but that may be just where he's from originally. Yeah, no, he's up... Uh, he's that way... Or, sorry, it might be Chester. I need to correct myself here. So he's... Could be Chester. Is, yeah, further. Ch- Chester's a bit further yeah. across, yeah, yeah. But, but not that far. And are you originally from there? Are you always from... No, North I'm North? originally from... Uh, oh, I've, I've got the mug, look, a Newcastle United mug. I'm originally from north of Newcastle. Um, so again, out in the country, but this time further north, um, kind of in the closest to the border in okay. um, to Scottish border yeah and hence the Newcastle United you still a United fan I, tell I you. am sadly we've um, not managed to win a game this season um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's not get into football we could be here a long time <laughs> well uh, we'll stick to business and marketing if we yeah um, now that's great um, and can you tell us a bit about your business I know you've told us sort of like you're, you're working now with smaller sort of clients um, and sort of how you got into it what was the big aha moment for you? Was that actually doing all the traveling that got you sort of into sales and marketing? Was it? It, it was. Well, I was doing kind of marketing and sales stuff, but for, for large organizations. So I worked for the pharma sector, for retail, okay, for yeah. big manufacturers. Um, and when I set up my own business, it, it was really just for, for me. It was to cut down on the travel and to kind of have more control over, over what I was doing. Um, and I set that up. And originally I thought, well, okay, I don't want to travel. So I'm based in the Northwest. Well, we've got one big pharma company I could work for. Um, let's think about manufacturers. Well, actually, it's kind of dying a lot um, here. And then, so the the first aha moment for me was figuring out actually, although my clients had been bigger businesses historically, um, what I knew how to do. Because as you get more and more senior in a consulting firm, for example, you switch from doing the work to uh, ma- managing the work, and then you switch to selling the work, to marketing and selling the consulting firm and, and, and the services of you and your people. So I realized that I'd become pretty good. Now, I'd absolutely not been a natural at it. I mean, when I when I first started off you know, give, being, being given responsibility for, for selling and then eventually marketing, I was just hopeless. Just didn't like it, don't like approaching people cold, don't like kind of showing off and seeing how great we are. So I had to devise and, and almost fall upon ways of marketing that weren't that kind of pushy, um, arrogant marketing style or sales style you, you, you might associate with salespeople. So I'd found that had worked for me and had become very successful at marketing and selling our firm. So I realized, you know what, I bet there might be other people who are consultants or into coaching and stuff like that who would benefit from learning how to do that as well. So that was kind of how I found my niche, as it were, um, at a, you know, looking around and then, and then finally realizing, actually, here's something I'm good at that other people um, kind of need as a skill. Now, originally, because of the geography, I, I started off doing it locally, doing training and consulting for consultants, yes, but there are more lawyers, there are more accountants, surveyors, yes, etc. 
Um, there's a and because consulting firms tend to be either very big and international or very small. And if you're doing consulting or coach, um, consulting or training, you tend to need a certain size of firm. So I, I spread my niche a bit. Now later on, I narrowed it again because I started doing stuff online. So I found that I could coach people over the phone or via Skype, and then of course sell online products um, and, and training, which meant I could be I could be global, uh, which meant I could really narrow my niche down to the people. Who were me? Um, I mean, my niche is really me. Um, yes. Other consultants and coaches. Of course, I still have you know some lawyers, some accountants, and people like that follow me. But I tend to write for people who are and, and produce things for people who are a lot like me. It's interesting when you said about like the the sort of old style sales techniques were really sort of quite pushy and quite heavy, or everyone sort of always tarnishes a salesman with a particular type mm. of you know personality or however they try and sell. But I suppose and how that's turned into content marketing now online for like yourself is just more of a gentle selling technique right yeah and although in all honesty you know the truth is that i don't think the stereotype is very true so of course there are some people and i worked with a lot of salespeople when i was working for for big firms and the truth is is maybe one in ten fit fit that stereotype yeah, yeah. um the rest of and often very successful salespeople were just like you and me it's just we have this image there are more mm. extroverts going to sales because they're told that's you know that's good for them but actually there are plenty of introverts who are successful as well and they they succeed in different ways they build stronger closer relationships rather than superficial relationships for example yeah that's as uh, i said people just tend to i suppose just think salesmen i oh, will just put them in that absolutely in that category do. and it's absolutely um, do so uh with what you talk about um so going from being in your sales side and then going into online stuff uh, one thing you said was you know you didn't know anything about it kind of thing and I think in this industry people always think they have to be uh, you know an expert in a niche or an expert in a particular field and I suppose in a way you are you an example to say you know you don't need to be an expert in that you can sort of use your knowledge and you need to, you need to I think the bottom line is you've got to add tremendous value to your clients so obviously, if someone pays you money to work with them, that's either because they buy something from you or you work with them as a consultant or whatever it might be, they've got to get tremendous value from that. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be the world's leading expert in that particular area. In fact, if you think about it, you know, most like if you did marketing for local businesses, you know, they don't need the world's greatest SEO strategy. They don't need, you know, the, the world's highest, uh, you know, uh, optimized website yeah, to yeah. get conversions. They need something that's good. And better than their competitors, and it, and so you know that level of you know the, the greatest expert in the world is only really needed by the world's biggest and most successful company. So there's a kind of like a pyramid. Most people need something that's good, not necessarily the best. Now you obviously have to be good, but I think you can also bootstrap it. So if if I follow what I've done in my career, what I was good at when I was working for bigger consulting firms was the more face to face stuff, the more traditional marketing and selling. So that's what I started off teaching to people. As I was teaching that, I was learning for myself how to do online marketing. Okay. So I got better and better and better at online marketing to the point where I was good enough that all my business was coming through that route, and then it became something I could teach other people. So I'm almost like a couple of years ahead for my own business, what most of my audience wants to know. Mm -hmm. and, then, and, and I guess that's a bit like bootstrapping in terms of setting up a business and you, you get good at one thing and then and, and people buy that and then in the process of doing that you get good at another thing and then people buy that and you kind of move on and move on. So the, you know, so these days, for example, I don't do any face-to-face -face marketing. I don't go out and do networking or anything like that. So I don't really teach that anymore. I teach what I've been doing for the last few years which has been working for me, which is online marketing. Online. Yeah, okay. That's... It's great. It's great how things evolve in even in businesses and going from because I suppose the more you teach something, then your clients, if you're making their money and generating them leads, they then want to learn a bit more from what you're doing. And like you say, you're yeah, a, yeah absolutely. I mean, I think it's important. Obviously, um, it, it, what you have to teach, what you teach has to work. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important that you do it yourself as well. You have to take your own medicine. So I am constantly kind of trying out new stuff. So, for example, for years. Um, I was very skeptical of Facebook and Facebook advertising mm -hmm. because all my, my folks tend to work for businesses, okay. as I do. So I, I'm kind of in business to business. It's small business, but it's not less business to business. Very skeptical, but I like to experiment. So a few years ago, I started experimenting with Facebook advertising, and it worked really well. I had to kind of eat my words, <laughs> learn how to do it. Um, worked really well for me and now of course I, I teach that to my clients because it can work well for a number of them not necessarily everyone but for a number of them it can well work really well at least you can show your experiences and your 
you know that's your your walking the walk to yeah. success. Yeah, that's a that's a big thing that you know. There's so many people pop up in this industry is like, you know, do X and you can you know generate more leads, and they never really tried it themselves. They've never done. They've just read it somewhere. But uh, you do see people buying someone else's course. Yeah, and you, you know, you've seen that wave with uh, uh, podcasting is a classic one where you know some people have made a lot of money podcasting and they build a big audience. People take their podcasting course, and then all of a sudden everyone is asking for <laughs> podcast interviews. It's like, and it, they, but and it's almost like a a pyramid scheme and it just goes yeah. waves you see in consulting and um, you see a lot of people at the minute promoting hey run a facebook ad to an automated webinar to a one-to-one -one call to a group coaching and most of those people have never done it yeah that's they just bought the course from a guy who had now originally one guy did do it yeah There's a few guys have done it and they may, and they do it really well and they know exactly how to do it but buying a course on something something does not entitle you to teach it to other people <laughs> not to be an expert because you 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 really make you miss you miss some of the subtleties. You have to do it for yourself yeah. or you have to do it with a client. So another way of doing it is to say to a client, look, there's this new method. I've not done it myself. Let's try it out together. That's you know, good. I won't charge you for it. Or if, you, if you've got a really good client you work, you've done some great work for and you work, you, know, you work well with them, they might be very willing for you to experiment. Then try it out, um, adjust it to get it to work, and then you can start promoting it wider. But you must yeah. be sure that you know how to make it work. That's a great tip and i hope listeners take that on board the people watching this what exactly what you just said there is don't don't just buy it and become a facebook expert because you've got the course speak to your client and say to them look there's a new course out by a very well you know person who's done it they've, they've done you know they're generating leads they're proven in this business do you want to try it together and that's i think people don't don't do that enough with their clients they did, might turn to them and suddenly go oh, i can i can add to do facebook ads i've set them up and i can run them and then it can go because if these things can fail, don't they? And if they're not testing it themselves, that's a great yeah. Thing about and, you find, and you do find, I mean, you've got to adjust it for different circumstances. Um, so you know, a lot of the leading edge folks, uh, it, it, it's like I guess you see with landing pages and, and yeah. stuff like that. You get this. Well, this is the one landing page that works the best, and it and, and it's been tested a thousand times. Yeah, but it's been tested in the internet marketing. Yeah, space. exactly. Yes, exactly. customers in that space are different yeah. to other customers. You have to test it in your own environment yeah. as well. Yeah. It's a the point about landing pages is there's no particular landing page which is like you said is right for every niche if someone you know is in the feminine niche feminine colors might be work better for that you know in the medical niche maybe orientating around medical type colors and things and people see this when we write something for a, a optimized press it's like well you know which page works for my niche and it's like well we don't know that you've got to test that niche and, mm. and it's like you say there's no right there's no one perfect landing page for everything you know there's also, i think there's also an evolution over time because uh a lot of the leading edge stuff, if you look at, say, what were the, the dominant um, landing page designs five years ago, yeah, yeah. Um, they were kind of ugly. They were ugly, big, bold, red headlines, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, and, and they absolutely worked, and they were tested, yeah. and they worked much better than kind of beautiful ones. But why was that? Well, often the first people willing to buy stuff on the internet and who are interested in the kind of things that were for sale were kind of a bit a, a bit bit rebellious themselves. They wanted to try new stuff. They were they wanted to get the underground and stuff that nobody else knew about. So if your page looked a bit underground, it was in keeping with that. But as buying stuff online has become more and more mainstream, you've almost seen the the designs become more mainstream. I remember when a couple of years ago, uh, Mind Valley, for example, started doing those really beautiful. Um, sales pages that weren't just you know ugly with headlines they had images they drew you through the whole yeah, thing yeah. they thought an awful lot and they tested those and those for their audience which was the kind of self-help but but um but a kind of softer um uh, audience worked really well for them yeah, um, yeah. and so these things do evolve these things do evolve as different people start buying yeah that's it it's that test test and test kind of thing you'll never know mm. um let's just go on about can you tell us a bit about your day-to-day -day? um Talk, talk, talking there a lot about business, but let's back to you a bit. Your day to day. I mean, you work from home, commercial premises. What you work from home? Well, I work from home, so this is like um, it used to be a dining room. Actually, converted into an office. I've had three offices in our house. I first bit, had an office in the loft, and I was just too lazy to go upstairs. You know, every time you wanted a cup of tea, you had to go down two flights of stairs. So I never really went up there. So I just bring the kettle up. Yeah, I didn't think of that. <laughs> I didn't have any water up there, so uh, I thought, you know what, let's shove the kids up there. And um, I'll have the downstairs one instead. So I work from this office here. I think it is important, if you're working from home, to have a space where you can go that is your kind of quiet zone. So once the door's shut, everyone knows, okay, let's leave Ian alone because he's in the office and he might be doing a webinar or whatever, but I might be just having some quiet time and thinking. Because if, uh, and I think there are different 
spaces seem, for me at least, different spaces seem to work for different things. So if I want to, to write an article, for example, I quite enjoy having a little buzz of noise behind me. So I'll go out to a coffee shop. Yes, so I'll yeah. take my, my, my MacBook over to a coffee shop and just, just type there, and that works quite well for me. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you find a space that works well for you for different things, um, interestingly, I've um, just be, one of the things I've been studying recently, um, not because I want to do it, but because I think it's an interesting creative process, is stand-up comedy. And there, uh, there's a technique a lot of comedians use where they have, when they are writing material and when they're then editing it, because um, comedy, you have to edit a lot. You have to take out almost everything to get to the punchline as fast as possible okay. so that you've got a regular stream of laughs. If you've got too much fluff in there, you lose the pace of mm -hmm. laughs. Um, and what they found is it often works better if you have a different room for being creative to a room for editing. Okay. So when they're kind of just talking over to themselves the jokes or the, or the monologue or whatever, they'll do it in one room. But if they start, if they need to edit, they'll go to another room. And it kind of sets the atmosphere for this is creative mode room. And I, I come up with ideas and I don't criticize myself. And I go into another room, and then I'm, you know, then I try and cut down everything. Drill down, and yeah. And I think that I found that true, not in the exact same way, but certainly in the sense of di I seem to do different things better with in different environments. Yeah, I, lo I'm, I, I love the coffee shop kind of. There's something about it. I can just yeah. sometimes do so much work in that time. Um, it's interesting that see, you know, I think a lot of people. I've tried probably like you. You've tried the um, the sound sites that play coffee music in the background. Yeah, I can never kind of, I've not tried that. I, I just couldn't get. I had to go to a coffee shop and the smell of coffee and everything. And also, when you work when you work for yourself, um, you know, you, you're kind of a bit alone during the day as well. So sometimes it's nice just to get out and, and at least have some human contact. Just yes, yeah. Shop. And are you, so, is it you alone or any colleagues or any of your wife? Yeah. Or it's, or? It, it's multiple things. My wife runs a very similar business to me, but in a different kind of market. She does um, training, coaching, well, now, now online courses in the early years education okay. arena. Um, so we sometimes talk over things because we kind of have, um, you, you know, because I do marketing sometimes. Uh, I have the usual relationship with my wife where I advise her to do things and she completely ignores me. That's the a, that's a way it goes, I think. Um, I, so I'm generally working alone. I have a couple of people do the odd thing for me, but I. Um, so what I do is I tend to have um, colleagues. I have a, a couple of mastermind groups I'm a member of where we'll either meet on a webinar type thing once a month and discuss yeah. stuff, or other people I'll speak to over the phone or on a Skype call, a smaller group every few weeks. Um, and another, you know, maybe another couple of people we meet up for coffee and discuss our businesses. So I kind of get. I think it is important to have other people around you who can help you and challenge you give you ideas and things like that um if you're not in a business where you have other people around you yeah. um just find them and people are you know and it's a, it's good for them as well so it's good for your it puts you back on track and it can just mm -hmm. like you say it's that creativeness as well you can actually i suppose from a mastermind group and or other people in business or other ideas can pop up just having a, a quick chat about something and yeah and it's very easy to get into your own kind of uh you know tunnel vision Yes. And, you know, the, absolutely. This is, and then all of a sudden, someone will say, are you sure? Have you not thought of this? And you go, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you, you'd be like, no, it's going to work. I know it's going to work. And it's like, no. So when someone else and other eyes are looking at a project, mm -hmm. obviously things can change. Um, uh, so talk about a bit about your business since you've started. Have you obviously you've seen obviously growth in your business through the small sort of business markets? Um, is there anything that you've noticed has, a, has been a huge impact on your sort of your own business itself? Was it the small businesses that were coming in, and or the small coaches say that were helping your business grow as it is now? Or is it the, is it the yeah, larger I, companies I, I, that are not? I found that um, if you remember back, so I'd been working with the large businesses. I started off working locally with kind of more medium-sized businesses, but I found that whenever I worked with very small businesses, so solopreneurs, um, you know, individual independent coaches and people, consultants and people like that, I enjoyed it more. Okay. Um, and also, uh, it got more action. You know what it's like in a larger organization. You, you you talk to people about doing stuff, and then it has to go through all the bureaucracy. And, and I just found that very painful. I, I wanted to see things happening quickly. So I found the smaller organizations um, I got the best results from, and I really enjoyed working with them. But the problem was they were smaller organizations. They were never going to, you know, a small, um, you know, one-man consultancy firm is never going to pay me £100,000 a year to do a bit of consulting for them. Um, and that can turn your marketing into a, into a kind of, it has to be, become more of a production line if you've got more smaller number of, uh, of, of uh, sorry, a larger number of clients paying you less each. Um, and you can't, that's where, I, you know, obviously I realized pretty quick that face-to-face -face stuff wasn't going to cut it for that because you just don't have the time to go out and court a relationship with someone who you're only going to do a little bit of work with. So that's where I started marketing online. 
Um, and that initially ha happened almost a little bit by accident. It happened for two things. One is when I was still an employed consultant, a friend of mine who was a magician in London um, phoned me up one day and said, hey, go to Google and type magician. And I went, all right, yeah. And he was number one in the world. Okay, well, well. Uh, so this was, you know, this, would be, this must have been about 15 years. Yeah, this shortly after Google came out uh, and it was becoming popular. So it was, I don't know, maybe eight, nine, ten years. Can't remember. Um, and he's very good, but he wasn't the world's best magician. <laughs> so, but, but, and then he Get a lot of traffic. He got quite a bit of traffic. And he then explained that, you know, he was getting most of his business from the web. Okay. And magic, and by magic here, I don't mean the people who perform in Vegas and stuff. I mean people who do close-up at parties and yeah. stuff like that right in front of your face. And it, it's always been a word of mouth business because people have this stereotype of a magician being someone off TV and it's all a bit cheesy and big boxes. But someone, if you see them live in front of you and they absolutely astound you and it's funny and whatever, it's a completely different thing. So they tend to work from referrals and uh, word of mouth. And he, yet he was getting all his business from, from online. And I thought, well, you know, if it can work for them, it can work for us. That was one of the reasons I set up my own business. I was kind of interested in it. Um, I started up a blog when I started my business just to kind of had some things I wanted to say. And within a couple of months, I was finding the blog was getting way more traffic than my you know, professional website. Um, and I thought, okay, well, let's just stick with the blogging then. Okay. So, that, so discovering that I could get online traffic um, was uh, the first step. R um, realizing that in order to... Uh, um, and I found after a while that a lot of the traffic was coming from the US, for example. Okay. Um, so although I was based in the UK, and if I was only ever doing live training and consulting, I couldn't service that market. So I thought, well, I need stuff I can do. So I kind of moved into, I moved from doing face-to-face -face marketing, face-to-face -face delivery, to online marketing with kind of remote delivery via phone or Skype, etc. And then um, I was still getting quite worn out by any, all the face-to-face -face stuff. So I decided let, I just need more um, more online stuff people can just buy. So I moved into doing online courses so that was a big step for me and then finally I guess the, the one of the biggest steps for me was was moving into into having a membership site okay, okay. because it, it it doesn't sound like a big difference between having one-off courses and an ongoing membership program but honestly the the freedom it gives you to kind of wake up on the first of the month knowing you've essentially got a guaranteed income that month mm -hmm. you don't have to get another product get everything going etc now sure you could lose some members you also could gain some members but it just gives you more stability and that frees you up to work on all sorts of projects without having to do certain things. Forced so, into doing sort of something. Yeah, yeah so, you know, my God, I need to pay the mortgage next month. I need to launch another product. Um, that doesn't happen. It's like, okay, things are all nice. I, there are certain things I need to do to keep the membership going, do a webinar for them a month, do critiques, go on the forum. But there's a whole load of content there already that they get. Um, so if I wondered, I could then play around with, well, what's the next level or how can I make another funnel, etc. So it just gives you a lot more freedom rather than certain things having to happen you can do things because you want them to happen yeah so so you've got that already set in place mm. we'll talk a bit about your membership site in a second obviously because you're using optimized member I, I or optimized press with it um so just a little bit back on traffic and the sort of small business stuff and how your business is changing could you give us people some little tips about your traffic strategies i've been watching your videos and i've seen your podcast i've actually listened to your podcast a few years back i remember a good year ago it was listen to some of the podcasts and some of the what I actually liked is there were just real businesses on there that you know they weren't mm -hmm. in the internet marketing space or something yeah. just, you know generally real businesses so what's your main traffic strategy now kind of things you do in video of everything um, I, I, I'm, I do a combination so I think it's important to have backup plans I think we've all been through if you've been in, in marketing for long enough you you'll know that all of a sudden Google will yes. change the algorithm yeah. or whatever so right now most of my targeted traffic comes from Facebook advertising okay but I'm careful that it's not going to be only that because Facebook, just like Google AdWords a few years ago, are tightening up rules here and there. And they're beginning to get a bit iffy about sending straight to a squeeze page. So, um, you know, there could well come a time where a lot of the strategies that are very effective on Facebook and let get you lots of you really kind of, you know, high quality conversions for low cost. Some of them might stop working and the cost per conversion might go up. Um, and so it may be time to switch to something else. But right now, Facebook advertising is working really well for me. Um, but on the back of that, I always do reasonably well in search. So if you search for phrases like, you know, more clients, how to get more clients and yeah. stuff like that. And that's really happened through some work I did years ago, um, you know, trying to understand what my audience was searching for. 
and then writing articles on my site and articles on other sites, guest blogging, etc. Yeah, I didn't go on the kind of mad guest blogging tours where you try and write 50 guest blog posts in a month, and stuff like that. Um, and I think I don't think that's quite as effective as it used to be because everybody everybody's was, doing yes, it. Yeah. But I've done a few, and uh, you know, I have because of I think it, it, things tend to work in levels. So because I've reached a certain amount of notoriety and fame, just in my own little <laughs> world, um, people ask me to write for them, for example. So salesforce.com, the uh, the big CRM system, asked yeah. me to become a regular blogger. HubSpot has did. I haven't even written for HubSpot uh, after they asked Get that one in. Blogger. Yeah, I really should. <laughs> but, um, so you, you kind of, it, it's all about stages. So just like I said with the bootstrapping of what you what you teach people, it works the same with your, with your own business, I think. That it's very difficult to go, you know, nobody's going to let you write for Fortune magazine um, when you've done nothing and you just write and say hey I've got some great ideas but if you in your own little world you write good stuff for you you write good stuff for other similar sized publications and blogs and then when other people see it and you just move up step by step so I did that so that brings me search traffic um, and I get a reasonable amount of traffic from social as well um, and I, now a social media I hope there are no social media gurus um, watching <laughs> because they, they would hate what I do on social media because they also oh you've got to interact and engage and all that and I do to some degree, but I'm quite quite a busy person. You know, email is my main way of engaging and interacting with my audience. Right. You know, I obviously do email marketing. I've written a book on it. But I also, when pe- lots of people reply to my emails and I interact with them there. Um, so on social media, most of my social media is automated in the sense of um, whenever I do a new blog post, I will tweet it out. I'll buffer a few up. Um, I randomly tweet out, you know, I have that little plug-in for your WordPress site that randomly tweets out old blog posts yeah, yeah. Yeah, three or four hours that gets some traffic now obviously if someone retweets what i've done or sends me a message on twitter i'll log in once a day and i'll respond to them i'll kind of be i'll i'll i'll, I'll be as human as i can be but i'm not going to sit on twitter all day or on facebook all day hours the audience because that's not my business yeah. now look if i had an old if i if my if i only needed 10 consulting gigs a year and my market size was 50 clients who are all on LinkedIn and in LinkedIn groups, I'd be on there chatting to them. But my, I, I don't do that. My audience is a much bigger, broader one who buy little things from me, so I need to be broad with my marketing approach. So you have to kind of fit your marketing to your market. Yeah, yeah. It's obvious, I guess. And in my case, because my audience is a bigger audience that buys you know, online products from me at a lower cost rather than a small audience that buys a lot from me, I'm going to use a marketing method that lets me reach a lot of people and have a light level of engagement with and brings them into my world. And then I can engage with them more once they're in. But I can't, you know, I can't chat to 10,000 people on Twitter all day um, in the way that someone could chat to 50 potential clients um, on, on a LinkedIn group or even on Twitter. That's a great point for people actually listening is you know your market and market them people. Don't just do what a guru is telling you to do. Absolutely. You know, there are, and, and as I say, I, 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 I'm always wary of telling social media experts what I do because they all hate it because <laughs> not all of them, but many of them, their, their view of social media is it's all about engagement. It's all about building relationships. And of course it is in some worlds, lots of worlds. It works like that. My world, I use social media more as a content distribution platform mm-hmm. To bring people into a different way I'll engage with them yeah yeah and that's great do you get much traffic from YouTube I know you've got your TV channel there as... um, not not massive to be honest um, I mainly use um, YouTube just as a repository for the videos um, that people come to the website yeah. on I do get some I've only got a few hundred subscribers on YouTube I've not I've not made a big attempt to optimize anything I might one of the things on the uh, on, on the agenda for next year is looking into YouTube ads. Okay. Um, I, I think Facebook ads are beginning to, you know, there are so many people doing Facebook ads. Yeah, that yeah. Two years ago when I started doing them, there weren't many people in MySpace doing them. There are, I don't mean MySpace, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe it's it come back, MySpace it? because the, it's come, maybe it's coming back, who knows. Uh, but uh, but the, there are, you know, YouTube ads are harder Mm-hmm. Because you know you got to make a video, so less people do them. So um, I might have a look at that, but I don't really use it a ton. I suppose once you learn it, you'll then be able to teach your clients. How that's to right. Do if it. I that's learn that. it, it works. Then I can yeah. teach it to people. Teach them what they know. Um, now that's good to hear. Uh, let's. Um, I will actually will link to your book as well. You've got your book um, for your email persuasion. Is it email persuasions? It is indeed. Yes. We'll link to that as well on this for people who haven't seen it, and they can obviously go and grab a copy of it there. Um, let's move on a little bit just about optimized press and how mm-hmm. you use it. Um, to, I know I've I found your sites. I've seen them a, um, a while back. I think when I was 
I think I found you initially through Entreport. That was I was looking at some Entreport stuff a good year ago, and I remember yeah, yeah. you were using it then. Well, that's how I discovered you. Okay. And now you're Active Campaign, I see. Which yeah, is I am. Yes. Great platform, and we love it to bits here. Um, but I was uh, so pleased when you guys integrated with it. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it was like uh, it's it's just it's beautiful. I think it's people have it's kind of one of these platforms that you either want Infusion and you can't afford it, or you want entreport and maybe you haven't got the technical stuff and again the budget for a small business they just haven't yeah. got that kind of money and, and i think i like, I like the thing i like about active campaign is they don't try and do everything yes so one of the things one of the reasons i switched from entreport um was just that you know the entreport has you know entreport's got a landing page builder well you mm -hmm. know i want to use optimized press or lead pages or yeah, yeah. because they are dedicated really good landing page builders i don't want to have to learn you know and and the the, the one from entreport was never as good as I could get with mm -hmm. uh, optimized press, or I could get a built-in template and lead pages to do. And they've got their own membership site, but it didn't um, plug in. But it didn't do it. So I ended up using Entreport only for the email marketing because okay. I and didn't the have all their add-ons. Yeah, yeah. And the automation. I didn't have one all their add-ons, um, and they were investing tons of tons. They still are investing loads of stuff. And I had a little Facebook discussion with their CEO recently, and I was kind of saying, "Why are you doing all?" This? And he said, "Oh no, we've got loads of developers, and you know our landing page builder is going to be so great." That no one would ever want to use lead pages or optimized press. I'm thinking, but why? But you're an, you're a marketing automation. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, just let let the let the landing page companies make the landing pages. Stick to your niche. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's um, one of the reasons why I like Active Campaign is they just stick to the marketing automation. And so, with your optimized press site, do you do everything yourself, or do you outsource any of that? I primarily do everything myself. I, I suspect I may have outsourced little bits and bobs. So. But I may because I'm going to be teaching people. So I have quite a few clients and people who are in my membership um, program who use Optimized Press themselves, for okay. example. And so it's always good for me to know how to do stuff so I can teach them um, how to build stuff with it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I have a, a, a program um, that, that's got 30 days to a steady flow of leads and clients. And it's had to go from kind of scratch to some um, face to face client building and some online client building and I teach them how to use it part of that is teaching them how to use optimized press to set up a squeeze page and stuff okay. like that so I kind of have to keep my hand in um, I, I'm also going back to my geeky roots from you know 30 years ago I still quite like playing around with it um, I do outsource bits and bobs but typically not the optimized press side because I think that's easy enough for most people to be able to do so you've, you've learned it yourself and it's paid off it's sort of time it's yeah I mean I was yeah, I was using optimized press right back right back from version one okay yeah, yeah. I had a couple of membership sites on there and then when version two came on obviously it was a big jump um, but I, I didn't find it that difficult to learn how to use it all and now you've got it, obviously, now you know it, you can teach other people. Uh, we'll link to that sales page. I've seen that sales page, um, mm. the 30 days when you see yeah. that. So we'll link to that here as well so people can get a look at it and see how it is. So the, you don't really, there's no, so you're doing it yourself, I suppose you're learning how everything goes. Um, and you, uh, now you're obviously going on teaching your clients if they want to build squeeze pages and stuff like that. Um, with your membership site, uh, do you use like, is it all optimized press? Do you use all the sort of built-in page functions and things inside it and... Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I, so the membership site itself, there are some sales pages um, on the site. There's uh, kind of one, there's the, the, an opt-in page. No, sorry, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of video sales page and some sales pages for specific products. I run um, about four or five products from the same um, site. Yeah, so. So I have a membership site and then I have my main, you know, continuity program, but I also have one-off products in there. And there's an advantage to that in that with having a common dashboard, if someone buys one product and they log in, they see the link to, you know, to access their product, mm. but they also see the links to all the other products that I've got available and a few words about each one and a buy button, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And so I do get sales through that. So it is nice to have one dashboard for everything. Um, and actually, Optimize, one of the things I really like about Optimize Press, there are lots of page builders, and I have tried lots of page builders, and, uh, and, and use other page builders in, in different circumstances. But one of the things Optimize Press does that no other page builder does, as far as I'm aware, is you can wrap short codes, WordPress short codes, around, around chunks of content. Yeah, or even so, rows. Like. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I do. Yeah. So what, what, what I do is, um, in, with most membership plugins, you have the you have short codes that say only show this content if they're a member or only show this content if they're not a member of or they bought this product or not. So what I do on my dashboard, um, I show a certain row if they're a, if you know if they bought that product and I sh which is you know the press the button to access it and I show a different row if they haven't bought the product which has a few words about it a little An quick upsell, sale kind of. 
and and uh, and a button to buy. That works really well for me, and it's only Optimized Press that can that can uh, really do that. That's great to hear. You, you, member Mouse that you're using for your I use membership. Member Mouse. Yeah. Yeah. So Member Mouse has got the uh, and I, I Member Mouse has got a bunch of stuff I like. It's like great the little plug stripe. It is. it is a wonderful um, plug in the way it handles certain things and like uh, the upsells, downsells, and the the one click purchases yeah. via Stripe. Um, works really well for me. Uh, I've been using that for quite a long time, so it's beeping Take in the background. Take the call if you want. <laughs> no, it's not a call. I think it's my printer it just started it's up. It's going to hit the power on here. Once. <laughs> <laughs> We're saved by the bell there. Yeah. So, um, member the, mouse, uh, sorry, yeah. so member mouse really like works really well with optimized press. So I've got a couple of a couple of sites. Through, I've got a couple of membership sites running on optimized press. I also have one for the for the for the book as well, which is a simpler site. Um, and the other things I do, so I do that. that the the short code stuff is really good. The reason I use Optimize Press for my membership site is, of all the page building bits of software, I think it's the most feature rich. Okay, so yeah. I, the, the, there will always be, you know, something I want to do. Optimize Press can always do it. So flexibility it, to yeah, it's kind of it's sometimes it's just the little things. So what I really like on my membership site is the ability that is the video thumbnails. I like having a little thumbnail and you click on it and it expands to the full screen okay, yeah. because that means I can put text next to it or the downloads next to it rather than, because otherwise with, with pretty much anything else you'd either have to have a small video yeah, or a big video and you wouldn't have a place for the downloads yeah, or other things true. like the, the download box mm -hmm. that doesn't seem like a lot but I've used other page builders where I've had to install an icon create a link and all that kind of stuff and it just takes ages with optimized press I just go you know it's, a da it's download links boom type the things in and select the icon from the link boom my download box is there so it's that kind of flexibility I use a lot and the fact it's got lots of features there's the short code stuff uh, so your favorite feature the short code being able to put like different I am like unable to have favorites oh, that's good. I can't have any favorite in anything in my I don't have a favorite color favorite, food, favorite TV show I like I always like variety variety so it's the uh, it's the short code stuff um it's the the breadth of the features is is really important to me so things like the video thumbnail the yeah, file yeah. downloads I use a lot in a membership site mm -hmm. um the automatic creation of a of an index page saves me a ton of time so with the hierarchy in optimized press you have a page and the sub pages and you yeah. just you know you put a box in there and it will make an index of all the mm -hmm. pages underneath it great saves me ages of making all those individual ones i just add it it automatically appears so that's really good yeah Cision. i don't know i don't know this is sounds a bit weird but there there are other page builders that are you know you could argue are easier to use than optimized press or you know because they're 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 perfect what you see is what you get mm -hmm. the optimized isn't quite press isn't quite but I always find that you get eighty percent of your page done with one of those you know oh, that's really good. and you think oh I need to add a bit more margin there and a bit and you can't do it okay it's and built and it okay it's kind of you get it eighty percent there really quickly and then it's like oh my god how do I finish it off and then you spend ages trying to get it exactly how you want it and you have to hack the CSS or whatever with optimized press there's just a box for everything so you know you're making a row and every row has you know, what's the padding what's the margin what's the yeah. whatever um, and the every element within it I, and there's always an option and it means if I want to have something that looks you know three columns wide or you know one third two thirds and I want this amount of space here and I want this here and that under I can always do it um, with optimized press whereas I find with other page builders I like them, and I can get to nearly where I want. But then I always kind of, oh, how do I do that? It doesn't, you know, you're not. It doesn't have the option. It doesn't have the option. Where's the book to get that? Another two days to try and tweak. Yeah, just right. kind of figure. Out. Now, in the end, I can get there because I've learned how to mess about. Yeah. With it. I, I, that's one of the reasons I recommend optimized press to clients. Is um, it's just got something for everything. So if you want, you know, no matter what you want to do, you'll be able to do it. Yeah, that's, that's um, uh, previously I was interviewing um, Kirk from Option Alpha, and he was he's saying he's a perfectionist and he wants the little. If he can put a little gap that big above his row, he wants to go and put that. Yeah, in, you know, no, and, I'm I'm the same. I just feel sometimes you have to give up on it, obviously, for common sense reasons. But, <laughs> yes, but days, I, yeah. I, at least I know with optimized press, I can get what I want. It's it's only because. There are some advantages. I know a lot of people ha like the fact they can, with other page builders, There, it's like a front-end one where they just go to their website and they type on it and, and it's kind of all there. Whereas with optimized press, you, you have to bring up an options box. But it just means for a perfectionist, you just type in, you know, I, I want 20 pixels, I want 10 there, I want it here, I want that there, and it's there. Whereas with the, some of the other ones, it's like it, it, the option just isn't there. 
I need to go and test some more of these just to make sure the, you know, Optimize Press has its flexibility. And I've tested, I mean, many of them. I need to, still a few that I need to dig up and have a good yeah. play with and see how they go. Um, I mean, I like I like others. And there's, there's it's because there are two camps. There are the, you know, Optimize Press and things like Thrive Themes, etc. are quite, and there's a few that you see like on the Warrior Forum or whatever, if you dare to delve in there. And unfortunately, with some of those, they're kind of here today and then no support afterwards, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is the, which is the worry. But there are a couple of good ones, like Optimize Press Thrive is another good one, and they work in a certain way, and they're very kind of conversion marketing focused. There are kind of other ones that are page builders, but the, for example, they don't have an opt-in box because yeah. they're not designed. They're designed for web designers, yeah, web, and yeah. the websites. They're not conversion or marketing focused, so they don't have the kind of things. That you would want in them, so you, you know it kind of pays you money and takes your choice. That's good. So that moves us on to sort of talking about opt-in boxes, things like lead magnets. Um, could you share with us your, like your best converting lead magnet that you currently use? Yeah, my best converting lead magnet is uh, it's just a PDF report. Um, I, I don't think the format. I think the concept is the most important thing. Almost the headline. So the thing that converts the best for me is a thing called the twenty-one word email that can get you more clients. So you know that. I like I like long names because it means I don't have to put a sales pitch for it because you you, you get you get it from the name. The title so it, does it. So it's a really short email that gets your clients. Yeah, okay, I want that, mm -hmm. and that that's enough. So I can just say to people, "Hey, do you want my twenty-one word email that get, can get you more clients?" Yeah, I don't have to say, "Hey, do you want my revolution email?" <laughs> and they go, "What's that?" And, oh, well, it can you know it feels like you're selling it there. Yeah, yeah. So and that really is just a short email that I've designed that's worked really well for me in the past and then I tried it out with a bunch of clients and it worked really well for them um, that gets them back in touch with a certain type of person um, and gets them back talking together um, to, with a view to working together and that's worked really well because it's short and it's high value you know people look at that and they think oh I could manage that you know even I could manage to do a short 21, email, yeah, 21 word email. words in it um, I did get someone complain because um, I say 21 words, you can extend it. So there are two, there are three blanks in there. Um, so there's some words, a blank, some more words, a blank, some more words and a blank. And obviously if instead of one, one word for the blank, you put five words, it makes it a 26 word email. And someone wrote it, well, it could be anything from 21 words to 40 words from what I can see. That's not very nice. I thought, oh, God. You can't please everyone, can you? <laughs> oh no, a 40 word email. Oh yeah, dear, dear me. And do you send the people who opt in for your uh, your ebooks? We'll we'll link to that again under this mm. under this um, post here. Um, do you put them through a sales funnel, or is it just okay? They're, they're into sort of a sequence. You can yeah, it will and... be so. It will be um, a couple of things going on. They will they'll, they'll sign up for the twenty one word email. The thank you page will be a video promoting a low cost. So it's a typical tripwire type thing that, that many of your listeners will know. It's a low-cost product that is an expansion of it. So it's four different emails with video training on each of them, um, each of them geared to get a certain type of client. Um, if they buy that, then there's an upsell to the membership program. Okay. So it's just an offer of a longer free trial of the membership program. Um, it, and then there's obviously the bits of funnel that if they don't buy, they get a couple of reminders. I do my funnels a little bit differently so the concept of my funnel would be similar to a lot of people's funnels. So a lot of people have a tripwire, and if people don't buy, they get email reminders of it. I have a philosophy with my emails that I, I want every single one of my emails as much as possible to, to add value as well to people who get them. Okay, okay, yeah. My audience, you know, being a consulting audience, it's not a kind of, it's not a hardcore buying audience. Um, consultants, coaches are people who love to give value themselves. They don't like to be sold at and pitched at. So I try not to. So... Whereas you might get a traditional, you know, you get offered a tripwire and if you don't buy it, you get a, hey, you haven't bought it. I'm surprised you haven't bought it. You know, it's a wonderful offer. Why haven't you bought it? And, you know, nagging them. With I send an email giving them some useful value. So the next, so the first email afterwards is, hey, have you downloaded? If not, here's the download, by the way. But after that, a couple of days later, they get an email saying, hey, he, you know, if you've tried it, here's another way of getting um, getting some clients. And you might want to try this. And at the bottom, it then says, you know, if you want to get even more, boom. So, so it's not quite a traditional, you know, hack at them <laughs> until yeah. they buy. Buy, it's, buy, buy. It's, it's give them some value, yeah. but mention the fact they could buy to get even more. Mm -hmm. um, and then they go into a variety of long-term nurturing um, sequences. So I have an initial startup sequence they go through that gives them kind of soup to nuts on how to get clients. Um, after that, they'll go into a regular once a week on a Sunday, longer piece, and during the week they'll get a little shorter broadcasts from me. And you bring them back to like optimized press pages, or is it all just done through email or the content that you're giving, uh, or is it just blog posts? And 
Yeah, um, a mix. It's it's a, it's a mix. Yeah. So you the, the during the week, I usually try to do a video, short five minute video tip once a week. I'll do a podcast every couple of weeks. So the the emails there will take them back to those. Now, depending on where they are, I've got I have got relatively sophisticated with that. In that, when you go to the the blog post with the video on, if you're coming from an email, it knows that and it knows you're a subscriber. So it'll just show you the email on YouTube, the video on YouTube. Okay. Um, and you can watch it and you can subscribe to the channel underneath. If you are not coming from the email, so if they then were to share that on social media mm-hmm. and people just came from Twitter or something, um, the video would be a wistier video with a built-in opt-in box in it. Excellent. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of, you know, a bit, a bit of kind of cleverness in there. Um, That's and that great. Would back into the funnel. You can tweak that and tailor that specifically to people coming from. So I suppose you could even go a bit further and say someone coming from a Facebook ad only want to show them a particular. Yeah, you could do all sorts of. There's a, there's a nice um, plugin people might want to look into called Visitor Logic Pro. Okay. Now I don't I don't actually use that. I ended up I ended up having having to get that co- my stuff coded before <laughs> this thing came out. Uh, in fact, I even paid someone to develop a plugin for me that did a lot of that stuff, and then this thing came out, and I went oh wasted all that money. <laughs> I could just buy it now. <laughs> buy it now. <laughs> um, but, but that does things like it will. Sh- it has blocks of content it will show based on whether they've visited the website before. Um, it will even communicate with your email provider to see if they're a member and stuff like that and show different bits of content for different ones. So the obvious thing would be if they're already a subscriber, don't show an opt-in box, show them a buy button for the for the next product in the, in the sequence or whatever. Um, so there's a bit of sense there. Um, so it's really just giving, tar- trying to give target. It goes back to email read, doesn't it? Given that you know, giving an email out that's more specific to the person that actually wants that content. Yeah, make it of. targeted and uh, make it valuable for them. And and then sometimes, usually, what I try to do is in most of my emails, um, it will have you know some kind of logical link into the join the membership program. Mm-hmm. So I might you know if I was to write an email about um, how to optimize your LinkedIn profile for consultants. Um, you know, at the end, it might say, hey, you know, lesson number seven in Momentum Club is about um, how to get clients through LinkedIn. You might want to check it out here. And that will go over to the membership site then with the sales page and, and stuff like that. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get some screenshots of your membership area so people can see how you use it and how you've built it and stuff. Um, I mean, I've had a look through sort of parts of it and I've seen your sales pages and things. So good for what well, I think it's nice for people. They don't like the feature you said about, <clears throat> excuse me, using the dashboard and being able to protect things with short code. Mm. Um, Kirk as well, he's doing exactly the same. He says right. you can have like one dashboard, but level one, see that piece of content, level two. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really, it's great to hear actually someone else is doing it. And I, sometimes I think I'm the only person coding that for people or something. <laughs> like, you can do this. It is possible. Um, no, we are using it. I promise yeah, you. That's great to hear. Like, yeah. That's excellent. Um, like, I know time is valuable. I could sit and talk to you about business stuff all day and, <laughs> chat on um but uh what i'll do is i'll i've got uh, we've got some random questions we asked people at the end yeah. of our success stories obviously your time is very precious and i don't worry uh, we've already keep... been here for an hour and we'll probably you know keep talking a bit more um so let's go back to smartphones all that kind of stuff if you use yeah. a smartphone a favorite app of yours you have a gosh well i've said i can't i don't have favorites i have a few favorites so i mean i use i use evernote a lot oh, excellent um yeah. and i you know one of the things when you're trying to create stuff whether you're a comedian a writer uh, a marketer take notes wherever you are it's absolutely crucial um, because nobody remembers so always have something there you can take notes on evernote is the thing for me i also use the scannable app which I don't know if you know, which is what I just use it for receipts. So whenever I get a receipt, I go snap. And it, it's like, a, obviously, you could just use a photo app, but Scannable finds the borders on anything mm-hmm. and just takes that. And then you press a button and it's in my receipts folder. So I use in that. Evernote. Straight, in Evernote, Evernote, that straight at the right Evernote folder um, where all my receipts are. Um, other things, you know, to be honest, I use stuff like the maps because I always get lost. <laughs> That's probably my most <laughs> used app. Um, the, the calendar, I use Sunrise as a nice little calendar on there. Um, I use, I have a thing called Goal Streaks, which I use. Um, and Goal Streaks, I don't know if you've ever heard the story of Jerry Seinfeld. Um, Seinfeld, people ask Seinfeld, you know, how he was so productive uh, as a writer of material, because he comes up with loads yes, of material. Yeah. And what he said was, look, he said, I just try and write material every day. And the way I do it is I have a little wall chart. And on the wall chart, I cross off the day where I've managed to write for an hour or 30 okay. minutes or whatever. And after a while of crossing off, you know, if you've written 20 in a row and you come to a day and you don't really feel like writing, you don't want to break the chain. So he said, my only goal on any day is don't break the chain, don't break the chain. And he keeps ticking off these things. And it is very motivating. Oh, 
oh god I've done 20 I don't want to let myself down now I've got to do 21 Just keep going Ghost, Ghost Streaks is an app that does that so it, it lets you say you know I want to work out three times a week or I want to um, I want to read for half an hour a day so every day it kind of puts up a reminder did you do your 30 day, thirty minutes of reading yes and then it shows you the thing and it's like oh I've had a 17 day streak I don't feel it oh I've got to I've got, I can't break the streak <laughs> so it kind of motivates a good uh Kind That's of good. For, for disciplining you to do stuff that you might not, you, you know, you you might easily just, um, you know, browse Facebook instead. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's good. Um, Kirk was talking actually about an app, Coach Me. He was in a sort of similar, probably kind of similar. Thing. Yeah, yours sounds quite good. I like that um, sort of that running streak thing. You have the days yeah. and you keep going. It's really simple because all you do is put them in and then you just tick whether you've done it or not. There's nothing complicated. Yeah, Even yeah. I press a button to tick it. Uh, with Evernote, do you use the audio or do you just type if you're taking notes? I will usually type. I do if I'm if I'm on the move. I'll use the audio. Yeah. But largely, I'll, largely I'll type. Largely, largely, I'm okay to, to kind of type. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I, I love Evernote. I've just sort of got into it more and more and more, and I'm. And amazing. I'm syncing it a lot with the computer as well. Obviously, the sync yeah. is good. So, if, for example, if I'm when I, I've made a course on Facebook ads, and I spent a lot of time just researching, and I, I spent about two months beforehand, just whenever I was on Facebook and I saw an ad that I thought was a really good ad, I would just clip it into Evernote, yeah. and it just went into a big folder. And when I came to make the course. It worked really well because I was able to look through them and go, you know what, there's a pattern here. There's two or three of these ads, or four or five of these ads, are type A, and there's a bunch of them are type B, and there's a bunch of type C. And I was able to, because I had that big repository in Evernote. Now, if you try and just, I know people listening might think, oh, well, I could just save the image in a folder somewhere. But it's just, it never happens. It's too yeah, complicated. It just being able to click the clip button, and it goes into the right folder automatically because it's quite... Um, intelligent about where it puts things that's the web clipper it's so, the web clipper yeah, the web clipper, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, so and then go back onto the computer obviously other than optimized press we won't mention that one as your favorite do you have a desktop or a computer app is it the same as evernote kind of thing the syncing or as you have evernote um screenflow tools? screenflow i use for a lot of stuff so if i'm making a video i try and make a video a week and i'll uh, i'll use screenflow to edit that um dropbox i find encrypt so everything i have to have a big macbook pro i have a little macbook air um, and it's all they're all synced everything synced, there yeah. synced on Dropbox which is really handy um, it's just little lit, to be honest I find the little stuff so I have a, a thing called copy clip which is a little which means I, I get 20 items in the clipboard so whenever I copy stuff I can just go back to one I copied yeah, five ago good. saves a ton of time um, a text for the Mac is another is a text expander so I just press um, it's copy clip for the Mac sorry yeah copy clips for the Mac as well there might be a PC one yeah, yeah. Um, but text expand is it any text expansion app that just saves you so nowadays if I you know boom and there's a whole email comes out in yeah. there and it just saves a ton of time. So it's it's little stuff like that I find is often the most helpful. I mean, obviously, I'm going to use Pages or Word and, and big stuff like that. They're kind of the givens. But little apps, even stuff like the web, webcam. I've got a little webcam settings app that lets me kind of zoom in, zoom out, change the white balance. Good stuff. It's just little things of productivity or just I improving. think so, yeah. That's, yeah. What, that's what's good for me. And I, so every now, usually about every couple of months, I'll go and you know scan one of the life hacker sites to find <laughs> a new toy. apps that will, will save yeah. some time. You've got to be careful you don't spend so much time reading about and installing apps to save me save your time that you burn all the time you would have saved. Yes. <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point. I apologise if you can hear music, sorry, screaming going on. I think my youngest child's woken up there, so I apologise. <laughs> um, Randomly, a piece of equipment on your desk. What, do you have a favourite piece? Do you have, do you have Gosh, a favourite? So I suppose I've two. Tool. Then I'll do two. Um, one is I've camera. So I've got a DSLR camera that I do all the. Um, probably wave it actually. Without, if I'm going to, there's a risk I'll knock the uh, we, the <laughs> webcam off. I'll gently bring it. Look, there it is. Okay, uh, nice. So I, it's just permanently up on a tripod with a um, a mains connector so it's just nice to be able to just flip that on record you know plug the mic in record myself mm -hmm. and I do a quick video and it's nice because I can blur the backgrounds and all sorts of stuff like that but on the other end of the scale I find this really useful this is uh, a bit of perspex that I can put big index cards in oh, so whenever I need one. to take notes I just flip out an index card write a note and I can stick it on the wall and file it somewhere and that's kind of really handy and I, I do like stuff that look. I think that looks quite nice. It's quite it's just stylish. clear and simple. Yeah, it, and use that as prompts for prompt cards as well. If yes, you're doing absolutely. If I was if I was doing stuff, I'd write prompts on there. And it would, could stick there. You can or you can organize your day on it. You can put your to do list for the day yeah. just on there, and you can see it all the time. Um, I, I, stuff like that, you just learn over the years. Having your go your new task for the day visible. Stop. I'm mean, so old. I forget what I'm supposed to be doing. But having them there printed. 
works and some things i'm a big you know tech person but sometimes just paper back to pen and paper and some, works better for some stuff and it, you know if it looks nice as well if things are nice to use i found with mind maps um i like using a nice set of um, pens you know different yeah. lots of different colored pens and just the feel of them and having nice you know having high quality paper instead of crappy paper if you if you get a good feeling from the tools you use yeah. It just kind of helps. More creative and uh, I think it just does it. Like, it relaxes you a bit yeah. and kind of feel you feel like a like you're be, you're creative. I think when you feel better, you'll produce better. Absolutely, you can Absolutely. focus more, can't you? And there. Mm. Uh, last question for you: Do you have a favourite book? I, I don't want to. I mean, you probably have hundreds. But <laughs> is there one particular? I I read a lot, and I sp- recently set myself a goal of re- you know reading thirty minutes a day, and I'm managing to okay. easily do that. Um, so I so I'm going through you know a book or two a week. Um, sometimes so I guess I don't have a massive favourite but I do I mean the recent ones I've read which I think are good uh, The Power of Habit is a really good book especially if you're a solopreneur or something like that and it's very easy to end up surfing Facebook or whatever and and it, The Power of Habit will teach you how to establish productive and effective habits so to look for cues that you can use you know when you're doing things that aren't productive it doesn't have to be productive. It could be, you know, really bad as well. But we went to look for things that trigger things and how to substitute them and do other things. Power of habits, good. Um, I really like um, stuff that James Altucher writes. Um, so the um, Choose Yourself series of books. I think there's important philosophies in there about, you know, the, that's the way the world has gone, where you do not have to wait for people to say, you know, I'll hire you to do this, I'll get you to do that. If you want to write a book, just write, write a book. It and get it published and bring in the other people to do that. Um, and so that I, I think that's a great book. Um, I'm reading a book at the minute about stand-up comedy called Comic Insights okay, yeah. by um, Franklin Ajayi, which has got some good... That's where some of the stuff about rehearsal and practice... It's interviews with really successful comics from the 90s. So, you know, it, it's... A, it's a, People who are not... You know, it's, it's, it's American, so it's the Jay Leno's and the... Um, um, Robert Kleins and people who are big in the ne- big in the eighties and nineties, but just to see how they come up with things, um, how they live with failure, um, because you know as a comic, you know as one said, you have to bomb for five years before yeah, you. Say it's hard, hard game. That is, it's a very hard yeah. game. Um, That's interesting. The, the concept you said about the creativity, then edit somewhere. I love that. That's um, yeah, and I, I'm using that now myself. I'm trying to separate the environment of, of kind of moving somewhere else. So I, I would just encourage people to read a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, lots it of books. Is very, is, yeah, read lots of books. It is very tempting to try and get all your education online or from blog, from blogs, from videos. And there's some wonderful stuff you get on blogs that you can't get in books because it's brand new. Yeah. So if you're reading stuff from people A or whatever on conversion optimization, that's going to be much more up-to-date than anything you can read in a book. But there's some classic stuff in books that is more, you know, it's less about, you know, T- tactics and just the evergreen type more about principles yeah, 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 yeah. as you say yeah yeah no, that's um that's great uh, i could keep talking about business and stuff with you for a long time <laughs> and now i've got your skype details i'll probably be you know, having a chat with you every now and then. <laughs> um but uh that's been great to speak to you and i'm gonna obviously I'll have to let you i will wrap this up and let you carry on with your day but and we'll link to all your sites this ianbrody.com is your main blog your yeah. main site and people can find all your products and your ebook and stuff and there we'll link link to all that obviously here below this blog post so um but thank you so much for your time we i mean really appreciate it and love to hear how you're using optimized press and we'll grab some screenshots and stuff for you um but yeah it's really great to speak to you and hopefully we'll get you back on here again for another one in My a year time and see how it goes from there yeah, but, yeah we'll, we'll let you carry on your day so big thank you and if there's anything specific you want to link to on the site we can do all that and get it linked to below this blog post so thank you thank you very much cheers